Welcome to ICU Fellowship Prepcast. Hi, I'm Maddie. Hi, I'm Swapnil. So today we are going to dive into three fellowship vivas. But before we dive into vivas, Maddie, how's life? Uh, life's pretty good. It's been very busy, um, but I've booked my annual leave and I'm going to go see my sister in New York and we're leaving in three weeks. So very excited. How? And I hear you've got some adventures coming up. Yeah, that's right. I'm getting deployed soon. So yeah, it's a very exciting time. So let's start with the first Viva. You've been asked to see 75-year-old male who has been in ICU for four days now after undergoing mitral valve replacement and CABG. He is currently ventilated and shocked, requiring ongoing cardiovascular support. Over this time, his platelet count has dropped from 386 which was pre-operative count to 109 post-bypass. And now on day five, it has dropped to 61. So, Maddie, what are the likely causes of thrombocytopenia in this situation? So the likely causes in this gentleman are via increased destructional consumption, decreased production, dilution, sequestration, or a fictitious result. So in terms of increased consumption or destruction, this might be drug-related, especially things like heparin, um, during bypass, it could be uh, post-transfusion purpura if he was transfused intraoperatively, or it could be antibiotics and common ones um, that can cause this are things like ampicillin, piperacillin or vancomycin, which he might have received as um, prophylaxis um, surgically, um, or digoxin, especially if he had some arrhythmias. Um, from a mechanical perspective, it could be if this was a mechanical mitral valve, um, it's less likely to be from the bypass circuit itself. Now on day five, you'd expect that to be recovered. Um, if he, It doesn't mention what kind of cardiovascular support he has. So if there's a balloon pump still in situ, it might also be a cause of thrombocytopenia. It could be unrelated, such as um, another cause of consumption like DIC, secondary to sepsis, or something like thrombotic microangiopathy, such as TTP or HUS, which can actually occur in the post-surgical population. From a decreased production perspective, it could be drugs, other antibodies, including beta-lactams or linezolid. It could be from a new or um, underlying infection, such as EBV, hepatitis, um, a different bacterial sepsis or HIV. And less likely in this man, but an underlying comorbidity, such as a neoplasm or liver disease. Um, from dilution perspective, it could be from massive transfusion if um, he did have a, a uh, rough course postoperatively, or it could be hemodilation dilution secondary to IV fluids, um, or it could be sequestration such as from hypersplenism or portal hypertension if he's got underlying things like liver disease. Fictitious causes is much less likely. Um, it could be if it was collect, collected in an EDTA tube. So to, to negate this, you can recollect in a citrate tube or if it was a traumatic venipuncture, puncture. But this is much less likely as if he's still ventilated and shocked, he'd be ha having um, arterial and central access. And so generally um, uh, blood draws wouldn't be difficult. Yeah, that's correct. And I think that's quite comprehensive list of thrombocytopenia. So how would you evaluate uh, this thrombocytopenia further? So this would require obtaining further information through history, examination and investigations. So the history would be targeted um, and include um, his course in ICU and trajectories, such as symptoms and signs that might point to another cause. For example, signs of sepsis um, or fevers, localizing symptoms, any comorbidities, especially things like autoimmune conditions, neoplasms, liver disease, any medications he was given, such as antibiotics, heparin, especially the time course if he was given heparin transfusions or if he did receive large volumes of fluid. Examination would once again be targeted at the signs, um, the, the cause of the thrombocytopenia at, as well as any signs of complications such as bleeding. So for example, signs of sepsis or autoimmune conditions, any signs of portal hypertension like, like hepatomegaly, any lymphadenopathy which would point to more of a hematological condition or potentially a viral illness. Um, any signs of bleeding any or DIC or purpura and any signs of thrombosis such as skin necrosis, leg swelling, strokes or limb ischemia. And then investigations would involve um, generally bloods to begin with. So this would be a blood film evaluating for schistocytes, which might suggest a microangiopathic process or other, other abnormalities such as spherocytes, which suggest an immune-mediated hemolytic anemia or hereditary spherocytosis. Things like a leukoerythroblastic picture, which would suggest infiltrative bone marrow processes, um, a leukocytosis with left shift, which would suggest infection, or immature white cells suggesting leukemia or myelodysplasia. 
Um, a full blood count would be important to see if all cell lineages were affected, um, which is more suspicious of a bone marrow issue. A coagulopathic screen, which would involve a fibrinogen D-dimer and coagulation panel to look for DIC. UECs and LFTs to assess for renal and liver dysfunction. Um, this would be important to assess for underlying liver disease, as well as some thrombocytic conditions such as HUS and TTP associated with renal impairment. And depending on the suspicion, further tests might be performed, such as an infectious screen with serology and blood cultures, B12 level if there's macrocytosis on the full blood count. If there's an intermediate or high probability of HITS, an ELISA for antiplatelet factor for heparin antibodies. An autoimmune screen, if your history and exam points to that, considering things like anti-cardiolipin and antibodies and ANCA. And an ADAMS 13, if considering um, TTP as a high, highly likely differential. Imaging is generally not part of the workup, but could, may, might be involved if evaluating for potential bleeding sites, such as a CT brain or a chest x-ray for a septic workup. And then finally, bone marrow biopsy might be, might be required if there's a concern for an infiltrative bone marrow process or, or neoplasm. Thanks, Marie. So you mentioned about the platelet factor antibodies for HITS. Now, these results have come back quite strongly positive. So can you elaborate on how does this test work? Yeah, so this is an immunoassay that detects the presence of antiplatelet factor 4 and heparin antibodies in the patient's blood. The way they perform it is by adding the patient serum to a plate which is coated with heparin and, and platelet factor 4 complexes. So if antibodies are, pa- are present in the patient's blood, they will then bind to these complexes on the plate. Then a second antibody um, to human immunoglobulin is attached to an enzyme and added to this plate. Following this, a substrate for the enzyme is added and the product of this enzyme substrate reaction results in a change in color. The color intensity is directly proportional to the degree of the conjugate binding which is then directly proportional to the amount of the um, hit antibody present. The color intensity is reported as the optical density at a specific wavelength, and a higher optical density represents a higher amount of antibody in the patient's serum, which is then more strongly suggestive of hits. And there's different cutoffs depending on the lab and the institution that you work at. That's great. So what other types of tests are available uh, to diagnose hits and when would you perform the other test over this PF antibody test? So the main other category of tests available are functional assays, and these assess the ability of hit antibodies in the patient's serum to activate test platelets. Um, the main type of functional test is a serotonin release assay, which detects the release of serotonin from test platelets in the presence of patient serum and heparin. The serotonin release assay is considered the gold standard for detection of hits and it's more specific than immunoassays, but it's also more expensive. It's less easily available and it takes longer to run. So I generally would only perform it if the immunoassay result was indeterminate, which depends on the op- optical density, or if there's an unexpected result. For example, the clinical suspicion is really high, but the immunoassay uh, results quite low. Um, also, in some institutions, the, the serotonin assay is performed if the um, immunoassay um, result is positive, but with the knowledge that this will take longer to run and we'd still treat as hits in the meantime. Yeah, that's right. And I guess before we send this test, usually you calculate your 4T score to find out what's the likely probability of this patient having hits. And I guess sometimes patients do develop hits even when they received uh, enoxaparin, so not necessarily only unfractionated heparin. So keeping your broad differentials and then narrowing it down with the diagnostic or confirmatory test is, is really important. Now, obviously, this patient has diagnosed now with HITS. What would be your approach um, if it's uh, currently requiring anticoagulation? So I think the important thing is firstly to stop the heparin and obtain baseline coagulation profile, check his organ function, so his renal and his LFTs, um, because d- that could also determine what um, anticoagulation is used. If this patient had no severe hepatic dysfunction, then I would start Agatraban. Um, that's basically an institu- uh, in an institutional policy where I work. Um, so this is a parenteral direct thrombin inhibitor, and it has a short half-life, and its effect can be monitored by the APTT. So this is useful in the post-cardiac surgery um, population, as it can be easily titrated and seized if required. 
It's also important to know um, with warfarin, um, it's not the patients aren't started on warfarin immediately uh, with HITS. They need to be um, at therapeutically anticoagulated with another agent um, for a certain period of time. Um, otherwise, there's a strong procoagulant effect of warfarin. Yeah, that's right. And I guess every institute will have probably slightly different preference. Like, for example, we use bivalurid infusion rather mm. than agatroban infusion. The, the idea is to have something which is very short acting, can be monitored and can be given as an infusion. So in case patient is developing bleeding, you can stop it. You don't need to wait for a reversal agent. And I guess once patients are stable, then they can go on the long-term anticoagulation. Fondaparanox is another alternative, yeah. which can be given subcut uh, in a BD dose. So I guess if the patient doesn't have any high risk of bleeding, then can be transitioned to fondaparanox uh, over bivalurin or uh, agatroban. Let's continue on, on the cardiac theme for today. So you are a part of multidisciplinary team assessing a high-risk cardiac surgical patient. Now, this is an 84-year-old female with symptomatic severe aortic stenosis and who is considered for an aortic wall replacement. She had a previous cabbage 10 years ago. Uh, also, she had a femoropopliteal bypass surgery four years ago uh, on the background of hypertension, diabetes, emphysema, and CKD. Um, so what further informations or investigations would you like to obtain uh, and why? So I want to obtain further information and written investigations regarding her aortic stenosis, other comorbidities and functional status. And this would be in order to perform an individualized risk stratification for this uh, patient and to assess the feasibility of performing a surgical AVR or other alternatives. Um, in terms of the aortic stenosis, um, this would deem the suitability for invasive surgery. So looking at the severity and any symptoms that she'd had, including dyspnea, excise tolerance, syncope, or angina or arrhythmias, and looking at the most recent echo results, looking at the valve size and area. In terms of her comorbidities, this would be in order to assess her risk and suitability for other alternative procedures. So as we know, it sounds like she is she's an elderly lady with multiple comorbidities and any surgery is likely to be high risk. So from an ischemic heart disease perspective, I'd like to know her previous details about her um, coronary bypass and any complications. Her last angio and echo, um, including if there's patency of grass or any LV or RV dysfunction, or any other valvular dysfunction and whether she's on any antiplatelet agents and any previous scars because then it might be difficult to do in certain populations minimally invasive techniques. From a hypertension point of view, it'd be important to know the control of her blood pressure, any medications and any hypertensive complications, which would also deem her help uh, determine her risk um, from invasive procedures. And from a CKD perspective, the extent, um, the cause, whether it's hypertension, diabetes or something else and any previous dialysis, um, baseline um, renal function and any imaging for a renal tract. As we know that patients who do have uh, cardio, cardiac surgery on a background of uh, chronic renal failure are more likely to have, a, have worsening of their renal failure. Um, from an emphysema perspective, it'd be important to know her lung function tests and spirometry, her number of exacerbations, her baseline exercise tolerance, any use of steroids or inhalers. Um, chest x-ray and CT um, and the presence and degree of any pulmonary hypertension. And from a peripheral vascular disease, this will be especially important for considering suitability of to arterial access with things like TAVIs. And there's also an increased risk of ischemia um, from some of these percutaneous methods um, in the presence of peripheral vascular disease. So I'd want to know a CTA to assess the classification of aorta and peripheral arterial cannulation sites. And the important, which is important for suitability of mini sternotomy. Also, if she has a porcelain aorta, it's a contraindication to a surgical AVR. Oh. Um, looking at the caliber of the femoral vessels, and this would also aid to see if whether a mini thoracotomy is an option. So it'd also be important to know about any comorbidities such as her liver function, any previous strokes, um, which might make bypass higher risk. And then finally, it, I'd want to know about her functional status and quality of life. So this would involve looking at her the frailty, so the cat's activities of daily living, looking at her muscle bulk, her weight, her mobility, as a significant risk of further deterioration post-op, her cognition, including her MMSE, and her social, social situations and supports, especially for the perioperative period. That's great. So again, it's not very common where we will get us to involve in, in the pre-op assessment for a patient undergoing cardiac surgery and it will vary center to center but I guess it's very important as an intensivist to understand what are the potential complications in this subset of patients 
if you calculate her modified euro score which will be quite high um and i guess she's very likely to have quite significant post op complications in her post operative stay in intensive care unit so it's important to understand what are the key parameters which will determine her overall trajectory after the surgery so i guess the next question is quite natural then if surgery is deemed quite high risk what are the alternatives to perform an avr in this patient so the alternatives are a transcatheter aortic valve implantation or tavi a balloon valvuloplasty or a purely medical management so a tavi is a, where a large sheath is inserted which is usually into the femoral artery and a wire is placed through the sheath and then advanced to go across the aortic valve and then this is used to guide a replacement aortic valve to the correct position it can be performed via alternative approaches rather than the femoral artery so it can be performed like transapically um, in patients with unfavorable iliofemoral anatomy. The, another alternative is balloon valvuloplasty, wherein a balloon is inflated within the aortic valve with the aim to increase the size of the valve and therefore temporarily relieve some of the symptoms. While this is a less invasive measure, it does not provide long-term solution um, as there's early restenosis of the dilated valve, but it's sometimes used as a bridge to a TAVI or for a surgical valve replacement. And then there's medical management, which is generally reserved for patients who are too high risk for procedures or have a life expectancy of um, less than one year. So this is mainly just modifying their like blood pressure and um, fluid status. Yeah, that's correct. So I guess what are the indications, advantages and complications of a TAVI? So indications, I mean, they're still being delineated, um, but they're usually reserved for patients with severe symptomatic aortic stenosis who are high risk or unsuitable surgical candidates and who do not have a contraindication for a TAVI. And they should also be thought to be likely to have improvement in their quality of life and symptoms post-procedure. Um, the advantages are there's a lower rate of major bleeding in AF compared to a surgical aortic valve replacement. It's less invasive. It avoids all the complications of bypass. It le it's less expensive, so it may also avoid ICU at stay. Some centres send them directly to the ward. Um, it also um, may involve, uh, avoid invasive ventilation. And outcomes are improving over time as there's increased operator experience and there's new technology and improved patient selection. The complications include access-related complications such as bleeding, limb ischemia, aortic dissection, um, or ventricular perforation. Mechanical complications such as annular rupture, um, uh, abnormal malpositioned aortic valve, aortic regurg, coronary obstruction or mitral valve disruption, and thromboembolic complications such as stroke or valve thrombosis. Um, there's also risk of acute kidney injury, arrhythmias, especially AV heart block. So some patients do then end up going on to require a permanent pacemaker um, and prosthetic valve endocarditis. Yeah, I guess Trivi has definitely revolutionized the treatment in patients with aortic wall stenosis or regurg especially in the elderly population, the, the overall complications are getting lesser and lesser. So let's move on to the third case for today. 25-year-old male cyclist admitted after a crash at 40 kilometers per hour. His GCS was recorded poor at scene. He's intubated. A CT brain shows petechial hemorrhages at gray-white matter junction, uh, but no extra axial mass lesion. Um, there are no other injuries identified on imaging or clinically. He's currently intubated sedated with morphine and midazolam at 5 mg per hour and his ventilation setting include SAMV, respirator of 14, tidal volume of 550 with a PEEP of 10, his afebrile heart rate of around 90 beats per minute, blood pressure of 100 over 55 mm of mercury, SATs recorded to be 96% uh, on FiO2 of 30%. The end CO2 is 40 mm of mercury. So can you please outline your management specific to this patient's head injury? Yep, so management specific to his head injury would involve a targeted history, assessment of his neurology with consideration of ICP monitoring if unable to assess clinically, and the main goal of prevention of secondary brain injury and supportive care. So from a targeted history perspective, it would involve having a look into his comorbidities, medications and allergies, and history of the incident itself, So any, especially focusing on any confounders for neurological assessment and prognostic factors. So things like suspicion of drug use, his time in ED, his GCS post-resuscitation, any presence of hypertension, hypoxia, seizures or pupillary abnormality, any treatment given such as fluid, sedation and paralysis, and baseline blood tests including electrolytes, BSL, organ function, so UEC and LFTs and a blood alcohol level. Neurological assessment um, would be involve weaning his sedation if there's no recent paralysis. So I'll check the train of thought and, and make sure there's no other confounders such as electrolytes, drugs or alcohol on board. 
Um, I'd also change it from Midaz to Propofol as a, as a shorter onset and offset time and easier to, um, to, to assess his neurology. And a discussion with my neurosurgical colleagues about an ICP monitor, given he was GCS4 at the scene, if I'm unable to assess him clinically and his GCS remains low. I'd also repeat his CT brain after 24 hours. In terms of preventing secondary injury, I'd want his SATs above 92% with a PO2 above 60 and reduce the PEEP if this level is not required as this is likely to raise his ICPs and it doesn't sound like he has any significant um, uh, pulmonary trauma or um, and unlikely to have any significant comorbidities at 25. Um, I'd want a PACO2 between 35 to 40 would correlate with this ABG um, and ensure that I've got uh, um, adequate arterial um, and central access. I'd avoid hypotension, um, so aim a map above 65 and um, aim a sodium from 140 to 150 and glucose of 6 to 10. Avoiding fevers with um, regular paracetamol and central temperature monitoring and institution of um, cooling measures if the temperature is above 37.5. Our institution, we do Kepra or Levitiracetam 500 milligrams BD for one week, although the Brain Trauma um, Foundation recommends phenytoin in patients where the overall benefit that is thought to outweigh the risk. Um, and ideally, the ICP is less than 22. So if there's an ICP, monitor is inserted and then target a CPP of 60 to 80. I'd ensure all the other um, first-line tier um, ICP kind of management with head of bed of um, 30 degrees and avoiding um, ties for the EGT using tapes instead and avoiding further bleeding, so correcting any coagulopathy. And then supportive care, such as um, provision of NG feeds, a PPI, initially mechanical DVT prophylaxis, and then a secondary and tertiary survey. Yeah, so I guess uh, you mentioned about the ICP monitoring, and most of the patients in tertiary care centers nowadays with a severe TBI, with a GCS of less than eight at the scene, intubated at, um, at scene or in ED, by default get some sort of ICP monitoring. Having said that, there is no much evidence in favor of ICP. So what are the current guidelines or the evidence in favor of using ICP monitoring routinely in these patients? Well, as you said, there isn't much. So the fourth edition Brain Trauma Foundation guidelines, um, which is generally what a lot of us go off, recommend insertion of an ICP monitor and ICP guided management in traumatic brain injury patients who have a GCS of three to eight after resuscitation and an abnormal CT scan. They're also recommended for patients with severe TBIs with a normal CT scan if they've got two of the following. So age of greater than 40, unilateral or bilateral motor posturing or a systolic blood pressure less than 90. However, this is based on very minimal evidence. So, But there is minimal high quality evidence assessing whether ICP guided management in patients with severe TBIs improves outcomes. Although it's difficult to get RCTs and high quality evidence on this because in our current clinical environment, it's considered almost a standard of care. So there's lack of equipoise to perform required RCTs. So we've got very poor quality evidence to go off. And now it's just basically um, institutional everywhere. Yeah, that's right. And then obviously the one large randomized control trial, which was performed in Bolivia with patients who were either given ICP monitoring or a CT scan, I guess did not show any difference between performing a CT scan versus routine use of ICP monitoring. Having said that, there were a lot of controversies around the way the trial was conducted and then the setting that it was conducted. So at the moment, we do do this dogmatic practice of putting ICP monitoring in every single patient, which gives us kind of a bit of peace of mind, I guess, that at least we know the what's up, what are the numbers. Uh, in a, but again, there are a lot of fallacies around which ICP monitor we are using and how we are using it. So I guess the, everybody who, it's like any other monitoring, people need to know what are the advantages and disadvantages and what are the kind of key drawbacks of each uh, monitoring. So I guess the another controversy in this subset of patients is DVT prophylaxis. So what's your practice that when you would commence DVT prophylaxis in this patient? So I think this patient is at very high risk of DVTs just by virtue of severe TBIs. We know that in isolated neurological trauma patients do have like double to triple the risk of DVTs. So I would commence chemical DVT prophylaxis in this patient if a follow-up CT brain at 24 hours showed no new or progression of intracranial hemorrhage and he had no other significant sequelae of trauma that was a contraindication to chemo prophylaxis, which it sounds like he doesn't. Yeah, I guess the only thing is caveat that is you need to discuss with your neurosurgical colleagues. Often they are the ones who are very reluctant to start any DVT prophylaxis at least for the first seven days. That's way too long. I know. And that's, again, without any evidence. So this is always going to be a controversial area and where you have to have ongoing discussions and negotiations with your neurosurgical colleagues, which is quite interesting. 
Now, can you list the prognostic factors for patients with traumatic brain injury? So there's clinical and radiological um, factors. So from a clinical perspective, an age greater than 40, um, a low GCS post-resuscitation, um, hypotension or hypoxia, any pupillary um, abnormality. So obviously fixed and dilated pupils is, very, is much worse. Um, and the presence of significant comorbidities. From a radiological perspective, um, CT findings that are poor prognostic markers are um, obliteration of the third ventricle basal cistern, midline shift if there's traumatic subarach or petechial hemorrhages, any brainstem injury or any unevacuated hematoma, and on MRI, any brainstem lesions, um, diffuse axonal injury or damage to the splint splenium of the corpus callosum. Oh, so there's also um, calculators that are used um, to help with calculating prognosis, and these include the uh, TBI impact calculator or the crash calculator, which um, you can get online. Great. Thanks, Maddie. So I guess that's the end of our three was. And as usual, we're coming to the last section of the podcast, which is more important. Have you got any joke for us today? Yeah, so it's a Halloween themed one because there's like a lot of Halloween decorations around where we live at the moment. Okay, why did the ghost go into the bar? Okay, ghost going into bar and it's a neuro theme. Obviously, it's not going to be to drink wine. For the booze. (laughs) (laughs) Oh my gosh, this is, uh, this was a that joke, Maddie. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> so that's the end of our today's podcast. We'll be back with another three sets of Vivas by end of next month. Till then, goodbye and have a nice time. Thanks for listening and see you next time.